Okay. All right, even. These, <laughs> these, these are just some of the stories I'll be talking about this morning. Arizona Republican House Speaker Ben Toma rebuffs efforts to overturn his state's draconian and incredibly unpopular 1864 abortion ban by telling Democrats, quote, I would ask everyone in this chamber to respect the fact that some of us believe that abortion is in fact the murder of children. Well, guess what? You're murdering Carrie Lakes and Donald Trump's chances of ever winning in November. The Senate impeachment trial of Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas is aborted right after conception. Speaker Mike Johnson risks his gavel by promising to bring Joe Biden's Ukraine supplemental to the floor for a vote on Saturday. Or will he? Donald Trump violates his gag order and begins attacking jurors in his Manhattan criminal trial. Yeah, that's a sure way to secure a not guilty verdict. First, you attack the judge's daughter, then you threaten the jurors. Is Rikers Island awaiting Donald Trump? You know, he can share a cell with his chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, who just got sent back in there for lying under oath to protect this orange turd. And is Melania going to be forced to testify? Donald Trump ingratiates himself with down-ballot Republican candidates by telling them to give him at least a 5% cut off their individual fundraising if they use his name or likeness. Lauren Boebert assures voters her recent blood clot had nothing to do with the COVID vaccine because she never got the shot. The chairwoman of Cimarron County, Oklahoma's Republican Party, arrested for participating in a kidnapping and murder plot. That would be the chairwoman of Cimarron County's uh, Oklahoma's Republican Party. All that plus Trump media closes on Wednesday up 15 percent. What did I tell you, MAGA morons? You never listen to me. This is the mop up for April 18th, 2024. We'll try to get to all those stories plus more. I'm David Feldman in New York City. Thank you for finding me. Please hit the like button so I remain in your feed. Subscribe to this channel and leave a comment. Unless, of course, you're a MAGA moron. You people are not welcome here. As of this morning, it now looks like Speaker of the House Mike Johnson will bring to the floor four bills on Saturday, maybe five. Three of those bills are foreign aid supplementals that are pretty much identical to the ones passed in the Senate. One bill provides $61 billion in funding for Ukraine. Another bill provides $26 billion to Israel. A third bill provides $8 billion to Taiwan and its neighbors to defend themselves against China. Then there is going to be a fourth bill that combines three bills into one. There's also a fifth bill, maybe. I'll get to that in a second. Very quickly, the fourth bill bundles three bills together. One is a ban on TikTok. TikTok will be banned in the United States unless it's sold to an American company. Then there's the Repo Act, which would take the hundreds of billions of dollars belonging to Putin and Russian oligarchs sitting in American banks, money that was frozen right after the invasion of Ukraine. The Repo Act would unfreeze that money and hand it over to Ukraine. And within that fourth bill is another bill that would create a Lend-Lease program with Ukraine where America would lend Ukraine weapons and then Ukraine would pay us back and return the weapons 
after they defeat Russia. Here, here are these bombs that we borrowed. It's basically just shrapnel, but here they are. That fourth bill, by the way, never going to pass. The bill that contains banning TikTok, the Repo Act, the Lend-Lease, never going to pass. There's simply no way that Republicans or any member of Congress would ever vote to take Putin's money sitting in American banks and hand it over to Ukraine. Putin would exact revenge on the politicians he owns. As I've been saying, there are some polonium-tipped umbrellas waiting for Mike Johnson and Donald Trump if Putin's assets make their way over to Ukraine. And more importantly, Wall Street lobbyists would never allow this because our entire banking system is built on money laundering for oligarchs, despots, and drug dealers. If you think, if you think I'm kidding, America is the number one money laundering operation in the world. We recently surpassed Switzerland and the Cayman Islands. So, it would be bad for business if we suddenly began taking assets that the oligarchs stole from the Russian people fair and square and then began handing that money over to Putin's sworn enemy. How could we ever be trusted again? When it comes to laundering money for murderous tyrants, all we have is our word. But this is why bills traditionally get bundled into what are called minibus bills. A minibus provides political cover for the Putin wing of the Republican Party to say, I can't vote for that bill because uh, it creates a lend-lease program for Ukraine or it bans, tic- t- bans TikTok when the real reason they're not voting for that bill is because they don't want to piss off Putin by seizing his assets. There's also a fifth bill on Saturday to beef up border security. Really? Mike Johnson is planning to introduce a border security bill. Now, we are being told as of this morning that Mike Johnson will be introducing a single subject border security bill on Saturday. You might remember two months ago, Trump ordered Mike Johnson to kill the bipartisan border security bill that was ready to go in the Senate because Trump needs to blame Joe Biden and the Democrats for doing nothing about the border. Well, Will Mike Johnson actually bring a single subject border security bill to the floor of the House on Saturday? I mean, this would be a standalone single subject bill, not attached to, say, funding for Ukraine. How could Republicans vote against it? They can't say, well, I I couldn't vote for it included funding for Ukraine. Well, they won't vote against it. And here's why this bill is so vicious, so cruel, so hateful, and racist, not a single Democrat would vote for it. And even if it did pass in the House, it would die in the Senate. But Johnson says he's going to do all that on Saturday. Border security will be the fifth bill. And remember, this is really important. The three foreign aid supplementals are also going to be single subject funding bills. Okay, how's this going to work out if it happens? I'll go over in a little while why I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, funding for Taiwan, not an issue. Funding for Ukraine raises serious problems for Republicans in the House. And it would be really interesting to see which Republicans have the courage to stand up to Putin. Remember, on Saturday, Republicans will have a one-vote majority. That means the Ukraine supplemental will pass with only a handful of Republicans. And it has a handful of Republicans. 
all it needs is one or two. The funding bill for Israel is a political firestorm for the Democrats in the House. As you know, the progressive wing is quite adamant about holding up funding for Israel because of the IDF's conduct in Gaza. It will be very interesting to see how many Democrats break ranks with Joe Biden and vote against funding for Israel. Again, this is why single-subject bills have gone out of favor in Congress. Members of Congress with single-subject bills can be held uh, to account for their votes. But when it's an omnibus or a minibus, like the fourth bill Johnson will be introducing, members of Congress are afforded the luxury of making up phony excuses as to why they voted against or for it. Now, hanging over all of this as we limp into Saturday's big voterama, hanging over all of this will be the very real threat to Speaker Mike Johnson's leadership. It is not inconceivable to imagine that he will no longer be Speaker of the House two weeks from now. Kentucky Republican Thomas Massey has agreed to co-sponsor Marjorie Taylor Greene's motion to vacate the chair. They have made it abundantly clear to Mike Johnson that should he bring that Ukraine supplemental to the floor for a vote, they will drag the motion to vacate the chair out of the Rules Committee, where it's been languishing, and they will personally march it over to the House floor and file the motion as privileged. Privileged, which means within two days, the entire House of Representatives must vote on whether Johnson has to give up the gavel. And if a simple majority says Mike Johnson must vacate the chair, well, elections for Speaker are held all over again. There is talk that Democrats in the House might save Johnson if he can get the Ukraine supplemental onto the floor for a vote Saturday. They have privately signaled that whatever number of Republicans desert him on a motion to vacate, Democrats will fill in all the holes. So, will we see all five votes take place on Saturday? I'm going to explain why this whole thing probably collapses and all five of these votes never take place. A little later on, I'll be digging in deeper to explain what's in those bills, considering this is your money. It's important to remember, cannot stress this hard enough, as Speaker Mike Johnson has only been able to pass spending bills through a parliamentary process known as suspension. He bypasses the Rules Committee, and the bills get taken to the floor for a vote. But because all the rules have been suspended, it requires two-thirds of the House to vote yes. Every spending bill Mike Johnson has passed was accomplished through suspension. And more Democrats voted yes than Republicans on all his spending bills. Johnson can only get a bill passed by suspending all the rules and then requiring two-thirds of the House to vote yes. And that means he's essentially relying entirely on the Democrats to get anything done, which is precisely why this is the most unproductive Congress in American history. That's a fact. The Republicans took control 
of House in January of 2023. It is officially the most unproductive Congress in American history. Well, if this happens on Saturday, we won't be seeing suspension. Mike Johnson says it's going to be different. This is why I don't think we'll see any of these bills voted on. I don't think Saturday is going to happen. I think they have a vacation coming up, a much deserved vacation. They only had a it was two weeks ago. They've only, it's been two weeks since the House of Representatives had a vacation. Friday, they get a week off. So I don't think they're going to stick around Saturday to vote on these five bills. This whole plan that Mike Johnson is laying out will probably fall apart as early as this afternoon, and that's because, as I just said, he is not suspending the rules. Why? Why isn't he? With all five bills that Johnson still is insisting as of this morning he will bring to the floor on Saturday, he is going through what is called regular order. Why? Why would he do that? No suspension. He's never been able to get a bill passed through regular order, always through suspension. If, if he is able to get these five bills brought to the floor on Saturday without suspension, that means he only requires a simple majority for each bill to pass. If he uses suspension, he needs two-thirds of the House. So these five bills will be brought to the floor through regular order, but maybe not because regular order means all five bills must go through the Rules Committee. And there's a distinct possibility they won't make it out. The Rules Committee is where bills go to die. And for all we know, that's precisely what Mike Johnson is banking on. I sense this is a kabuki dance. I sense Mike Johnson is going through the motions of trying to get these five bills to the floor. But he also knows if the Ukraine supplemental makes it to the floor, he's no longer speaker. But if these five bills get tied up in the Rules Committee, then the House goes on a one-week vacation starting Friday night, and Johnson lives to fight another day because those bills won't be voted on. You know, he's lasted six months. He may prove himself a survivor. Ukraine won't survive, but Mike Johnson will. I suspect Mike Johnson is right now presenting himself as the adult in the room who's earnestly trying to get funding to Ukraine. But dag nabbit, I just can't seem to get it out of the Rules Committee. And we know there already is a movement within the Rules Committee to kill the Ukraine supplemental, to kill all the foreign aid supplementals and make Saturday's voterama impossible. Well, the real issue heading into Saturday is the Ukraine supplemental. That's the $60 billion question that needs answering. Zelensky desperately needs the $60 billion. Everything else can wait. If the Ukraine supplemental dies in the Rules Committee, and I have every reason to believe it will, there is one end run available to Democrats, and that would be something called a discharge petition. I've talked about this. It's a parliamentary procedure. There are currently two discharge petitions circulating to force the vote on Ukraine. One comes from Democratic Congressman Jim McGovern. The other comes from 
Brian Fitzpatrick, a Republican congressman from Pennsylvania. There are enough Republicans to vote for the Ukraine supplemental, but Johnson refuses to massage the Rules Committee. So what's going to happen? If a majority of House members sign one of those two discharge petitions, that means the Ukraine supplemental gets yanked from the Rules Committee It gets yanked from the clutching claws of Mike Johnson, and it's forced onto the floor of the House for a vote and will pass with a simple majority. A discharge petition, unlike suspension, suspension you need two-thirds of the House. A discharge petition, simple majority. There are Republicans in the House like Don Bacon of Nebraska, who just told Politico that he would sign a discharge petition when Johnson can't get the Ukraine supplemental out of the Rules Committee. We know that the Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, the Republican chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, support the Ukraine supplemental. That's three Republican votes right there. And given that right now, or as of Friday, Johnson's got a one-vote majority. On Saturday, he'll only have a one-vote majority. The Ukraine supplemental would pass if they could get a discharge petition signed and presented by then. But the discharge petition won't be ready by Saturday. Then they'll have to go on a break for a week, and during the the week vacation, the discharge petition will be signed, and then when they come back from their much-deserved vacation, the discharge petition would be presented, and there would be a vote on the Ukraine supplemental. So, between now and Saturday, the question is, will Johnson be able to get these three foreign aid supplementals out of the Rules Committee and on the floor for a Saturday vote. I would be surprised if he does, because I would be surprised if he wouldn't be perfectly content to see these supplementals die in the Rules Committee. If Ukraine gets voted on this Saturday, rest assured that will automatically trigger a vote on him to vacate the chair. Marjorie Taylor Greene's motion And if he doesn't survive that vote, then we hold elections again for a new speaker. He can run again for speaker, but he will have to vacate the chair first. You might remember when they voted for Kevin McCarthy to vacate the chair, he he did run again for speaker. Uh, Or did he? I don't remember. Let me know in the comments section. I, I think he I don't think he officially ran again for speaker, but he was putting out feelers. Again, if Ukraine passes on Saturday, that's what next week would look like. Uh, this is what if Ukraine supplemental somehow gets passed, uh, and this is important I mean, this is the diff- Zelensky has made it clear. If this supplemental doesn't pass, he will lose the war. Ukraine, so if Ukraine, if Ukraine somehow, if somehow the Rules Committee releases the bill and they vote on it on Saturday, Ukraine would immediately start getting the money. Congress would... uh, then take the week off. Momentum builds for a vote the following week uh, for a vote on vacating the chair. Even Matt Gates, who introduced the motion for Kevin McCarthy to vacate the chair, is now warning that Johnson's days are numbered if Ukraine gets voted on. Gates was keeping his powder dry. He didn't want to challenge Johnson. But apparently that ethics investigation into his violating the Mann Act isn't uh, going as well as he wanted to. So now he's threatening to uh, vote 
to vacate the chair. Just so we're clear, because it's a lot to take in, if these three supplementals, Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel, all die in the Rules Committee, and there is a distinct possibility they will, there is also a distinct possibility it's exactly what Mike Johnson is planning on. Then there's no vote on Saturday. He and the rest of the Congress get the week off. Johnson is still Speaker. A discharge petition during that period would probably gather enough signatures to force a vote on Ukraine when Congress returns in a week. With Republicans holding a one-vote majority, uh, the vote on Ukraine would then pass easily in the House. Biden would sign it. And because it got voted on through a discharge petition, Johnson can then say to the hard-right Freedom Caucus, he can say to Trump and Putin, I couldn't control this. I had nothing to do with this. I did everything I could to tie it up in the Rules Committee, but the discharge petition took the Ukraine supplemental out of my hands. Johnson could even vote against the Ukraine supplemental, and it would still pass, which means he might be able to keep the gavel. A discharge petition means... Ukraine gets the money, and Mike Johnson keeps the gavel because he would not incur the wrath of Putin and Trump. It's been more than a decade since we've seen a discharge petition. They're rarely used, but it's also been 150 years since a cabinet official has been impeached, and that would be Alejandro Mayorkas. The entire Senate on Wednesday was sworn in as jurors. The entire Senate became jurors to decide whether Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas should be convicted on two articles of impeachment and removed from office. It took only three hours for the democratically controlled Senate to acquit him on both counts with a vote of 51 to 48 and one vote of present And on the other article, a vote of 51 to 49. There was no trial. A simple thumbs up or thumbs down. No trial. Chuck Schumer, Senate Majority Leader, Democrat, refused to dignify these articles of impeachment. But that didn't sit well with some Senate Republicans who wanted a trial. Here is... Republican Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana about, I don't know, 10 days ago in the well of the Senate beseeching Majority Leader Democrat Chuck Schumer to have a trial, to put Mayorkas on trial. You know, I don't agree with John Kennedy. He's a Republican out of Louisiana. I don't agree with him, but I sure respect his oratory skills. Take a listen. Madam President. The senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, a lot of history has uh, unfolded in this. Wow. It's just chilling. Like Cato. This must have been what Cato sounded like in the Senate. Cicero. It's like, it's like he should be in a Roman toga. Well, <laughs> rewind that and watch that. It's Senator John Kennedy, who never fails to... Uh, but he's, don't confuse him with Senator John Kennedy of Massachusetts, who became president. They have nothing in common, although I think they have about the same amount of brain matter left. But that is Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana. Well, while this entire impeachment 
was a political stunt, indeed laughable. It still made history. As I said, Mayorkas, <clears throat> a Latin American immigrant who oversees our nation's immigration and border policy, became the first cabinet member in 150 years to get impeached. The House impeached Mayorkas in mid-February. It took two months for those articles to get delivered into the Senate, no doubt to coincide with Donald Trump becoming the first president in American history to go on trial inside a criminal courtroom. This supposed border crisis is supposedly the biggest crisis facing our country, at least so says Donald Trump and Mike Johnson and the Republicans, and yet on orders from Donald Trump, Mike Johnson killed the bipartisan border bill that came out of the Senate, the most comprehensive border bill in three decades, because Trump needs the border to run on in November. Instead of passing the border bill, Mike Johnson and the House Republicans decided to blame the so-called crisis on Alejandro Mayorkas and impeach him. They decided to politicize an issue that was already politicized. And then Johnson waited 60 days to march his articles of impeachment into the Senate only hours after Donald Trump's criminal trial began. What are the odds? This isn't about border security. This is purely about controlling the narrative. Donald Trump is on trial for paying hush money to a porn star who he had unprotected sex with right after his wife Melania gave birth to their son. So, hey, look over there. We're impeaching the Homeland Security director. The border is and always has been an imaginary crisis concocted by Trump to gin up rage and anger against dark-skinned Spanish-speaking people while at the same time, look over there, distracting the American people from what he and the Republican Party were really sent to Washington to accomplish. Lower taxes for the wealthy and deregulate the administrative state to benefit Exxon and Wall Street. Alexander, Alex, Alejandro Mayorkas' job is safe, at least between now and Election Day. The same cannot be said for Speaker Mike Johnson, who has been able to hold on to the gavel for six months but just like the Republican Party's one-vote majority in the House, Johnson's speakership is hanging by a single thread. A single vote. One vote. Maybe two. Depends on who shows up. One or two votes is all it takes, and he has to vacate the chair. All it takes is one member of his caucus to call for a motion to vacate the chair, and then... Again, depending on how many members of Congress show up to vote, all it takes is maybe one, two Republicans to vote in favor of his removal. He's gone. And then elections for speakers start all over again. Johnson, seemingly, this week has two choices. Do nothing between now and Election Day. Pretend to work on the 2025 budget which comes due October 1st, or deal with the $95 billion foreign aid supplemental that passed in the Senate, the one that Joe Biden is willing to sign, especially since it provides that much-needed $60 billion in military aid to Ukraine. What is Mike Johnson thinking? What is his calculus this is important. Foreign aid for Ukraine, the $60 billion, 
will determine who wins. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has gone on record and said this $60 billion supplemental is the difference between Russia winning or Russia losing. So, what is Mike Johnson thinking? Does he want to go down in history as the one who lost Ukraine? He will be remembered. If the supplemental doesn't get voted on, Mike Johnson goes down in history as the one who lost Ukraine because we all know the votes are there in the House for the Ukraine supplemental. The only one blocking that vote is Mike Johnson. For six months, he's delayed the vote on aid to Ukraine, knowing full well there were always enough votes in the House to pass it. By delaying the vote, by pretending he wants to catch a border bill to the Ukraine supplemental and then killing the, the border bill along with the Ukraine supplemental, then spitballing other ways to fund Ukraine, from lending Ukraine money to giving Ukraine frozen Russian assets, he has been able to keep the conversation and the debate going while Ukraine, which up until August was beating Russia, is now losing the war. Why is Ukraine losing the war? Because Biden has been trying to get aid to Ukraine since August. It could be argued that Mike Johnson has conspired with Trump to do what Donald Trump has been doing successfully in three of his four criminal trials. Delay, delay, delay. Keep the plates spinning until Trump is back in office where he can then make the criminal trials and Ukraine go away. And by making Ukraine go away, I do mean making Ukraine go away. This is what the supplemental is about. Is Ukraine going away? Trump gets his marching orders from Vladimir Putin, and Putin has made it evident he wants to make Ukraine go away. Putin believes that Ukraine is part of greater Russia. And his invasion wasn't just to reclaim the Donbass region, which consists of mostly Russian-speaking Ukrainians. The purpose of this entire invasion was to reclaim all of it, all of Ukraine, and make it part of Mother Russia. So, Trump's plan, and I think it's probably Mike Johnson's, is placate Putin by stalling until Trump is sitting in the Oval Office and then giving Putin everything he wants. Just below the surface, you already hear pro-Putin messaging within the Republican Party to justify letting Ukraine lose. And it's getting louder and louder. If you listen to conservative media, if you listen to the far-right Putin wing of the Republican Party, you hear things like Ukraine is run by Nazis. Marjorie Taylor Greene said that yesterday during a House Oversight Committee hearing. She said, why are we giving money to Israel and at the same time giving money to the Nazis in Ukraine. And Jared Moskowitz, whose grandparents survived the Holocaust, said, you got to watch what you're saying because the Nazis are not running Ukraine. I suggest you go to the Holocaust Museum to learn what a Nazi is. Or you can just look in the mirror. He didn't say that. But if she wants to know what a Nazi is, she should look in the mirror. Uh, she's vocal about it. You hear her say and other Republicans in the House say that Ukraine persecutes Christians. 
you hear that Putin invaded Ukraine to save Christians. You hear Ukraine provoked Putin into invading because Ukraine was persecuting Russian-speaking citizens, persecuting Christians. You constantly hear that Zelensky is corrupt, secreting money out of Ukraine into an offshore account while his wife goes on lavish shopping sprees here in New York City. Not true. Now, there, there was, it wasn't the Panama Papers. His name did show up. He does have some money in an offshore account, but uh, a lot of people have money in offshore accounts. I think he owns a home in London. But the Russian propaganda is he's stealing billions and his wife is coming to New York every weekend to shop on Fifth Avenue. You hear Putin's talking points, not just from conservative pundits like Steve Bannon and Tucker Carlson. You hear these talking points now coming from Republican members of the House. On yesterday's program, I talked about Republican Ken Buck, who just left Congress because he couldn't take the dysfunction anymore. He calls Marjorie Taylor Greene Moscow Marjorie because she parrots Putin's talking points word for word by insisting Ukraine is persecuting Christians and that, that uh, Putin invaded Ukraine to denazify Ukraine, to denazify a country whose president is Jewish. He invaded Ukraine, she says, to rescue Christians. She says now, Marjorie Taylor Greene is now openly saying, we must side with Russia to protect Christians in Ukraine from the Nazis. This is what Marjorie Taylor Greene is saying. She is now saying she doesn't want to give Ukraine any money because she wants Ukraine to go away. She wants Zelensky to be defeated. She wants Putin to take all of Ukraine. And if she's saying it, there are a lot of Republicans who are saying it, just not as loud. You know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is a QAnon spouting joke. But so is Donald Trump. Just because they're jokes doesn't mean they're not dangerous. I told you about the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Turner, going on CNN and warning that members of his own Republican Party have been infected, that's the word he used, infected by Vladimir Putin. He said members of his own Republican Party have used the House chamber to deliver speeches that parrot Vladimir Putin's talking points word for word. I told you about Republican Mike McCall, chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, who has also been warning about members of his own party spouting Putin's talking points word for word. Mike Johnson knows there's a Putin wing of his party because he's part of it. Mike Johnson secretly likes Vladimir Putin because Putin persecutes the LGBTQ community. He's white. He purports to be a devout Christian. And just like Mike Johnson is an authoritarian who doesn't trust citizens with the vote. Never forget that it was Mike Johnson who slapped his name on the amicus brief before, 2000, before January 6th challenging the election results in the Supreme Court. He is a world class, Mike Johnson is a world class election denier. Months ago, I reported on Tennessee Republican Tim Burchett, 
one of eight House members who voted for Kevin McCarthy to vacate the chair. I told you that Tim Burchett, Republican, says there's no doubt in his mind that members of his own party are beholden to and under the influence of Vladimir Putin. Tennessee Republican Tim Burchett said, I have no doubt that Vladimir Putin has compromised on several members of my own Republican caucus. Tim Burchett said, the compromise is that many members of his caucus cannot keep it in their pants. Burchett said he has no doubt that right before any vote on any bill that jeopardizes Vladimir Putin, a Russian operative drops off a manila envelope with pictures in it. And suddenly, according to Tim Burchett, that House Republican is voting precisely the way Vladimir Putin orders him to. We must never forget that Putin came to power as an ex-KGB agent. He has always trafficked in Kompromat. That's how he rose to power in Russia. And we know from the Mueller report that Putin has compromised on Donald Trump because Trump has been laundering money for Putin and Putin's cronies since the early 2000s. Trump is beholden to Putin because Putin is holding on to all the financial documents that would expose Donald Trump. It's why Donald Trump held on to all those classified documents. There are boxes and boxes of classified material that never left Donald Trump's sight once he became an ex-president. Donald Trump would literally travel with his boxes of classified material. Those boxes have been described as his security blanket. What was in the boxes? What is he keeping on Vladimir Putin? What has he learned from our intelligence agencies about Vladimir Putin that he's holding on to? What is Donald Trump keeping on his enemies in his own party? What's in those boxes. Mike Johnson never expected to become speaker. But there he is. And now, as far as he's concerned, it's divine providence. In Mike Johnson's tiny Louisiana backwater hick of a demented brain, he believes God put him there. In fact, he said that. He said, God put me in the speakership role because he says, I fancy myself Moses, the lawgiver. He said this. Moses, he's Moses, who, if you believe the Old Testament, and why would you? Moses talked to God. Moses talked to God. If you read Genesis, if you read the, the five books, the Torah, Moses is talking to God a lot. And apparently, just like Moses, Mike Johnson is talking to God. I don't mean he prays to God. He talks to God as in, hey, God, how you doing? And God says, hey, girlfriend, I'm not talking about signs from God. I'm talking talking actual heartfelt conversations late into the night where they dish, where they play little games like F, marry, kill. Mike Johnson and God are literally talking about who they would F, who they would marry, and who would they who they would kill because he's Moses. 
and he's best buddies with God. That's how tight Mike Johnson thinks he is with God. To put it another way, Mike Johnson is more than just a devout Christian. He's a schizophrenic. Mike Johnson is schizophrenic. We have a schizophrenic who hears voices in his head as Speaker of the House. And instead of getting the medical attention he so richly deserves, instead, he says, I don't hear voices in my head. I'm a Southern Baptist. Instead of, you know, you can treat schizophrenia, but Mike Johnson says, no, no, I'm not, I'm not mentally ill. I'm a Southern Baptist. And for those of you who aren't quite familiar with the Southern Baptists, well, imagine someone reading Mein Kampf out loud with a down-home country twang. That'll give you a rough idea of what Southern Baptists believe. The point I'm making is never, ever vote for someone who says he talks to God and God talks back and tells him, you're Moses. There are straitjackets for people who talk that way. Seriously, this is how serial killers talk. And I'm being serious. This is some really sick shit. Really sick. Don't trust anyone who says they talk to God or talk to to Satan. For example, most of my listeners are too young to know who the son of Sam was, David Berkowitz, who also talked to God and Satan. But unlike Mike Johnson, David Berkowitz had the decency never to become Speaker of the House. He was just a serial killer back in the 70s. Taking orders from the son of Sam, who most of us were misled into believing was the name of a German shepherd named Sam telling David Berkowitz to kill. A point of personal privilege here, because this has been bothering me for decades. I want to clear up some misconceptions about Son of Sam, because it really pisses me off. I am now going to set the record straight about Son of Sam, as well as David Berkowitz, because the lies must end. First of all, it wasn't a German shepherd talking to David Berkowitz. It was a black Labrador retriever who told David Berkowitz to kill. It was not a German shepherd. And this really pisses me off because German shepherds have been getting a bad rap ever since World War II. And then right after the civil rights movement, you know, in the 60s, when they were used by Southern sheriffs to attack black people. So they get enough bad press already. German shepherds don't need to be linked erroneously to being the dogs who told David Berkowitz to kill people. Okay? This makes me very angry. It turns out it was a very cute Labrador retriever who was telling David Berkowitz to go out and kill. Not a German shepherd. Yeah, see, everyone loves Labrador retrievers. Nobody could imagine that it was a cuddly, obedient Labrador who was giving the kill orders. So... Who do they blame? Blame it on the German shepherds. But it wasn't a German shepherd. It was a Labrador retriever. 
See, the cute ones can get away with anything. Think about that the next time you see a Labrador retriever and he's getting all googly eyes with you. They're not so nice. They're not to be trusted. And especially, don't listen to what they have to say. They give bad advice. Some will give you bad investment advice. Some Labrador retrievers talk behind your back. And others can be so persuasive, they can convince you to kill. That's what happened to David Berkowitz. Secondly, Son of Sam. Let's talk about the name Son of Sam. I have always had a problem with the dog's name being Sam. Who names their dog Sam? Turns out, nobody. The dog giving the orders to kill was not named Sam. He was the son of Sam. Why was he the son of Sam? Because the neighbor who owned the Labrador Retriever was named Sam. David Berkowitz called the dog son of Sam because the dog belonged to his neighbor Sam but the dog's name was not Sam. I don't know what the dog's name was, but it wasn't Sam. And David Berkowitz wasn't the son of Sam. That's another thing that pisses me off. Stop calling David Berkowitz the son of Sam. The dog was the son of Sam. David Berkowitz was never the son of Sam. And the dog he was taking orders from was the son of Sam. But Sam wasn't the name of the dog, and David Berkowitz wasn't the son of Sam. And nobody will tell me what the name of that Labrador was. What was the name of the Labrador telling David Berkowitz to kill? Also, how come David Berkowitz doesn't have a middle name? Every famous killer has a middle name. John Wayne Gacy, John Wilkes Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack the Ripper, middle name The, Sirhan Sirhan had a middle name. It was Sirhan. Sirhan Sirhan's full name was Sirhan 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 the third, or Trip. His friends called him Trip. But David Berkowitz, no middle name. Why? Why? Because nobody could believe there was actually a serial killer named David Berkowitz. Everybody was shocked. His name is David Berkowitz? Who ever heard of a serial killer named David Berkowitz? What kind of name is that? What kind of name is David Berkowitz for a serial killer? Everyone was in such a state of shock that there was a serial killer named David Berkowitz. They never bothered to find out what his middle name was so he wouldn't be confused with any of the other David Berkowitzes out there who weren't serial killers. But I'm guessing that wasn't really an issue for all the other David Berkowitzes out there. I'm guessing when the receptionist said, Dr. Berkowitz will see you now, and you sat in his dental chair, looked up and saw his degree from the dental school, and it read, Dr. David Berkowitz, I'm pretty sure the patient wasn't saying, now wait a second, are you the David Berkowitz who murdered on command from a Labrador retriever? Because if you are the David Berkowitz, I know you called that dog Son of Sam, but Sam was the name of his owner 
What was the dog's name? What was the dog's name? Nobody will tell me. Anyway, maybe I shouldn't do five shows in a row. Maybe. I don't know. This is, I've done five shows in a row now. I don't know the name of the dog. I know it wasn't Sam. And I hope to one day find out. I'm hoping it was Fluffy or Izzy Bemelman. That's, that's a good name for a, a Labrador who tells people to kill. Anyway, back to Mike Johnson. As I was saying, Mike Johnson talks to God. And he thinks God is talking back. These conversations with God that Mike Johnson is having, according to Mike Johnson, are all about keeping abortion illegal and making sure more and more members of the LGBT community commit suicide. That's where Mike Johnson's head is at. And he sees Donald Trump as the conduit, the sinner, but the conduit who sacrifices his own soul in order for the angels to win in the battle between good and evil. This is what Mike Johnson thinks. This is what God told him. God told Mike Johnson to see Donald Trump as the indispensable, sacrificial lamb that good Christians like Mike Johnson need to defeat Beelzebub. You forgive Trump because he delivered those three justices that the deeply religious need to overturn Roe. And now, this is what God told Mike Johnson, Like Jesus, Donald Trump is getting crucified by the state. In Mike Johnson's head, Trump's four criminal trials are a passion play where Donald Trump is held accountable, where he must suffer and die in return for all of us in order to deliver this country from the evils of abortion and men kissing. According to Mike Johnson, this is why Donald Trump is the savior. It's why Mike Johnson sucks up to him. It's exactly why Donald Trump says on the campaign trail, I'm being persecuted for you. Trump is literally telling his deeply religious morons that he is the body of the MAGA church. And that is why Mike Johnson has been planning to stall on Ukraine, to serve Donald Trump, his Messiah, who takes his orders from God, who, in Mike Johnson's tiny mind is Vladimir Putin. This past week was supposed to be, and I'm not making it up, appliance week. I wish I were making this up. This week was supposed to be all about putting Alejandro Mayorkas on trial and then introducing a series of bills designed to portray the radical leftist Joe Biden as a monster dictating what kind of appliances you can and cannot use. I am not making this up. Okay? Mike Johnson's original plans for this week and next, after the, uh, the week after the v- vacation, was to begin debate, I am not making this up. His plan was to begin debate on the Suds Act. What is the Suds Act? Stop unaffordable dishwasher standards. Suds. It's an acronym. Get it? HR 7700. Look it up. I'll wait. Look up the Suds Act. Introduced on March 15th of this year, and it was going to be debated 
on the House floor this week. The Suds Act prevents Biden's Energy Department from enforcing energy conservation standards for dishwashers. According to the Suds Act, these standards are not cost effective. Okay, this is something the dishwasher lobby has been trying to get past. The Suds Act. And the talking point, and I'm not making this up. Remember the light bulbs? Remember the light bulbs? Now it's the dishwashers. The, the, the talking point is that Joe Biden and the radical left are making dishwashers more expensive with their radical agenda to dictate how we live. But it's not just dishwashers. Another bill Johnson was about to introduce this week was, and I'm not making this up, the Liberty in Laundry Act. The Liberty in Law, yes, the Liberty in, look it up, the Liberty in Laundry Act. Biden's energy department is robbing us of our liberty, our liberty to wash our underwear the way we choose. Because, as we all know, the very first thing Adolf Hitler did when he seized power, he immediately prescribed what kind of washing machines and dryers German citizens could and couldn't purchase. That's what Joe Biden is doing. He's doing what Hitler did. Dictate, he wants to dictate how you wash your underwear. And then, look it up. There is the Refrigerator Freedom Act. Again, another bill that protects our freedom to purchase refrigerators that spew greenhouse gases and require way too much energy. Because it's not a Joe Biden's business if I want a refrigerator that destroys the planet. These appliance bills were supposed to be on the agenda this week, not Ukraine. It was supposed to be impeach Mayorkas because he's not protecting Americans from this imaginary invasion of dark-skinned people pouring over the border to rape us, rob us, take our jobs, change our culture, our language, and, of course... Vote for Democrats. That's what they say. Those migrants are coming here really to vote for Democrats. They crawl through mud to vote for Democrats. That's what the Republicans are saying. And that's what Mike Johnson was doing down in Mar-a-Lago last week, working on legislation. Working on legislation he crafted with Donald Trump to prevent undocumented migrants from voting in our elections because you know like voter fraud it's a let's create another imaginary problem undocumented migrants voting mike johnson was helping his messiah perpetuate the lie that donald trump keeps losing the popular vote because millions of quote-unquote illegals are pouring over the border to vote for Hillary and then Joe Biden. And that was Mike Johnson's plan for this week. Keep the migrant crisis alive. Keep Americans scared of dark-skinned foreigners. Introduce these appliance bills in order to get Republicans talking about how Joe Biden and his radical left want to control every aspect of your life, from how you wash your boxers to how you wash your dishes and how you refrigerate your food. And while Republicans are spouting lies about government being your enemy and the migrants are going to 
kill us. Ukraine falls to Russia. But he's been forced to introduce the Ukraine supplemental. And I doubt, I doubt it's going to make it to the floor on Saturday. These Republicans are the dumbest, most dishonest, most corrupt, most transparent, most evil politicians in modern American history. And yet almost half this country is going to vote for them in November. And if they win, we deserve what's coming our way. What are you doing to stop this? What are you doing? Spend an hour a day, not an hour, not a day, a week, an hour a week volunteering for your Democrat, local Democratic Party. One hour a week. You'll meet some interesting people. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. There is no poll, right? Okay, I don't have a poll. Uh, So I want to thank uh, Bob in the chat room for keeping the conversation civil. Please remember to hit the like button if you enjoyed any of this nonsense. Please, uh, I don't know if you're going to share this one (laughs) with the Son of Sam nonsense. You might not want to share this, but subscribe to the channel. And let me read the super chats. I know that name, Ian McLaren from Australia, right? Thanks from Cape York. I think it's from Australia, right? You deliver depressing news just the way I like it. Thank you, Ian. And then Kait Oz Australia, Ms. Spock. Uh, pair character stretching his arm forward, raising his thumb up. Oh, I guess these are emojis, okay? Thomas Riegler. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, K. Stenjohn. Sten- K. Stenjohn. Mike Johnson is an election-denying, card-carrying, oath-keeper, and Christian nationalist. I think he summed it all up. And Carol Knowles, Ph.D. No, David, you should do five shows in a row or six or seven. Yeah, okay. I'll try to do another one. I I think I've lost my mind. Uh, Okay, thank you, everybody. Maybe tomorrow, uh, if they haven't come for me. Thank you.